as I was hearing about the conscience that we should have towards God and the matter of um, making sure that we settle matters and not allowing bitterness or envy, any anything of that nature, and forgiveness with others. It was As I was sitting here listening, I was thinking about this, something that I had... Um, read from uh, from Brother Zach, um, something from Leviticus, which isn't, normally people look at the book of Leviticus and think that it's a boring book, but there's some, um, really some uh, wonderful truths about the holiness that the book portrays. Um, and I wanted to look at Leviticus 13 for just a moment. Uh, in light of what we heard today, I was thinking about this matter of Again, how we should be living with this clear conscience before God. And, um, of course, Leviticus is a picture of uh, a lot of the things that we read there are about how we should live or how the people of Israel should live a clean life uh, physically. And these were signs and, and symbols of, of Christians years later of how we should live our life spiritually. One of the things God does is he takes two book or I'm sorry two chapters in Leviticus to speak about leprosy and um, and I've thought why would why would the Lord take two chapters about this disease and when you read through Leviticus 13 it has all these different scenarios of leprosy which leprosy of course is a symbol of of sin um, and it speaks about how you would be uh, you, uh, without the camp, and you couldn't, you couldn't fellowship. You couldn't be around other people. You had to stay so far away, and at times you would have to declare yourself unclean because of the leprosy. Um, and, and you get to Leviticus 14, and my Bible sometimes has titles at the beginning of the chapters, and it says the cleansing of lepers, and. Uh, that's what the chapter is about. Uh, once a leper um, is cleansed, what is the process? And before I even get into Leviticus 14, there was something I was thinking about in Leviticus 13. I, I heard this first from Brother Zach, um, so this isn't something I discovered on my own. But it says um, in Leviticus 13, it says in verse... Um, we can start in verse 12. It says, And if a leprosy break out abroad in the skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him that has the plague from his head, even to his foot, wheresoever the priest looks, then the priest shall consider, and behold, if the leprosy has covered all his flesh. flesh. Now before I go on, you would think that what it's saying here that the priest, if you look at someone with leprosy all over, you would think, okay, they must be pronounced unclean. But I've heard this, again, I heard this from Brother Zach, one of the wonderful truths that we discover in Leviticus. It goes on to say that he shall pronounce him clean that has the plague. Not unclean, but clean. And the way that I heard Brother Zach say this, and I'm probably not doing it justice, but this is the person that doesn't think that anything good dwells in their flesh, that they realize that, um, that they need to be cleansed. And I thought this was amazing that the, that the Lord hides this truth in this chapter, that the person that you would think, and it reminds me of the, um, uh, when Jesus told the story of the Pharisee and the publican, where the, the man says, uh, just be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. He doesn't. I, I, he doesn't think anything good of himself. But the man who thought, "Well, I'm I'm good. I pray. I tithe. I go to go to church." You know, this was the Pharisee. This was the man that was not justified. And I see here the person with leprosy, <clears throat> where it says he's covered all his flesh. Um, that this is the man that that is pronounced clean. Then you go over to chapter 14, and again, this is, this is some thoughts that came to me as I was listening to this message this morning, and it could probably be talked about a lot longer than what I'm sharing, but 
I just wanted to put some highlights in, in Leviticus 14. And this is the person who comes and he wants to be, um, he comes before the priest. And we see, um, we can start in, we can start in verse 13 of chapter 14. And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. And here is the cleansing part here in verse 14. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And of the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering, and the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. And so what we see here, I see this in light of having this good conscience toward God, um, leprosy being a symbol of sin, and the man recognizing that there is nothing good um, and then he can be named clean. And then I see when he comes before the Lord, what the priest does. And of course, the they didn't know this in the Old Testament, but this was symbolic of the blood of Jesus. Um, in verse 14, when it talks about putting it on the right ear and the right thumb and the right toe. And then again in verse 15, then we see the oil come into play, which is the next step, which is, of course, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And the priest, where the blood was, the priest puts it on the same spots. And then, uh, and then finally, the last bit of it in verse 18, it says, the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed. And this is the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we often pray about. So I see where... I see why the Lord puts these two chapters in. And again, I, I was not clever enough. This is not something that I found in my own study. This is something that I heard from Brother Zach. But I see why the Lord decided to take two chapters out to show us what is so important about this, about keeping a clear conscience. And I see it in this example of what we read about in leprosy. So that's all I had to share this morning. But I think it's very important that we take this this word seriously, what we heard in this message this morning. Amen. <clears throat> As I was listening to the word uh, today, very convicting word, I thought about uh, Paul uh, and his life, and I thought about uh, Philippians three. Philippians three, uh, ten through fourteen. Um, heard this last week that that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Um, and the reason why I was thinking of, of Paul today is that even after Paul had lived his life uh, from the age of 30, when he came to the Lord, he was wholehearted and he uh, wanted to know the Lord, uh, but he didn't take it for granted. Um, and in verse 11, that he's going to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Um, that even though he lived a, a, a wholehearted life up until then, he still didn't have it in his heart that he just assumed that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a part of the resurrection from the dead. He said that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, and, I, and I was thinking of how Paul um, did what he uh, taught, because in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, in uh, verse uh, 5, 5 and 6, it says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Um, and that's what I want to be in my life, that I don't want to assume that I'm going to be a part of that great entrance, as RJ was saying earlier, uh, that there's going to be a glorious entrance uh, for me uh, uh, with the resurrection, uh, after the resurrection from the dead. Uh, but Paul said uh, in Second Timothy, toward the end of his life, um, familiar scripture, uh, Philipp, uh, sorry, Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Now that he's come to the end of his life, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And we know that the Bible says that Paul said that follow me as I follow Christ, and I want to follow, uh, follow Paul in this, uh, that he didn't assume that he was going to be a part of the resurrection from the dead, um, just because he had gave his life to the Lord, but he had lived his life wholehearted life toward uh, Jesus Christ, giving his life for him. Um, and and then it was not until the end of his life that he was able to say, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Now there is a crown laid up for me in righteousness. And I just want to take that to heart that I want to examine myself in light of what we heard today um, and test myself to see if I'm in the faith and that I do not fail the test um, and to ask the Lord to examine me um, because God is the one who examines the heart. He tests, the Bible said, he tests the reins, he tries the thoughts. Um, and as we oftentimes hear that, uh, the first place that we look after a convicting word is not inward, uh, which I always oftentimes do, oh, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. So we look inward instead of looking to God. God is the one who brought it to our attention um, and he's the one who tries the hearts. He tries the reins. Because if I look inside, I will say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm going to be a part of the resurrection from the dead. Uh, but the Bible said the heart is deceitful and, um, and who can know it? So I have to look to the Lord for him to, uh, to bring that. He's the one who tries the reins. He's the one who's trying my heart. He's the one who's uh, examining, and then in the light of that, I can examine myself, and I want to always uh, want to go to the Lord and say, "Lord, you show me." I want to see: Am I going to be a part of the resurrection of the dead? Am I, uh, in light of of what we heard, am I in? You know, is Christ in me? Am I in Christ? Uh, because I don't want to fail the test uh, in the last day, as we heard.